Hey guys, welcome back to this series where I go through random RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one I have a physical copy today and this is something I just got, Gods of the Forbidden North. This is volume one. Um, this is uh, uh, essentially the first part of, um, of a region slash mega dungeon for old school essentials. Um, it is an incredible book. This book is so dang good. Um, I cannot wait for part two and part three to come out. They're not out yet, but part one is out. And you can get it in physical copy or in PDF. Now there are upsides and downsides to the physical copy. I love having the physical copy, but the PDF might be uh, more to people's taste. First of all, it's way cheaper, but also there are some advantages with maps and things like that. Now, I think if you get the physical copy, you'll get the PDF too. Um, but it's just a question of whether you want to invest in the, in the book itself. Now, the quality of the book is excellent. Um, now it's print on demand from DriveThruRPG. So it's not going to be the best quality book you're ever, ever going to get, but it's certainly solid, glossy finish. It's a, look how big this book is. I mean, it's massive. <laughs> this book is 470 pages. Now a little bit of that is acknowledgements and like legal stuff at the very end, but only a, com a couple of pages. And then of course there's, you know, uh, the cover pages and stuff like that, but it's, it's a huge tome and it's heavy. Um, this book is incredibly impressive. It's a labor of love by the author. Um, and a pulp hammock press, or hummock press, excuse me. Um, the, uh, the author, the designer, um, it's Robert Alderman. And uh, it's dedicated to his family. Um, and I think his wife helped him on this as well. Um, Gods of the Forbidden North is, a again, a labor of love and an incredible piece of RPG um, a material just to have. So the Forbidden North here is a brief map of it. Essentially what you have here in volume one is an introduction to the region. This is a, a part of his world. The rest of the world is referenced and uh, obviously comes into it by way of you know uh, association, but it's not detailed here. The, the Forbidden North itself, this region, is what is detailed in this book. Um, in addition, there are lots of adventuring sites there's a sort of mini adventure that's going on at the beginning to introduce you to it. Um, the major city is detailed for quite a bit, and there's uh, you could do a, a long city campaign there, in the um, in the main city of the Forbidden North. But then there's also a, a series of major locations with dungeons attached and adventures attached to them that you can go out and explore and find. Um, and then there is one location in particular that has the first few levels of it detailed here, but it's going to be detailed further in Volume 2, and that's going to be the mega dungeon that goes deep, 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 deep down into the earth. And so it's going to have Volume 2 and Volume 3, I think, are going to detail more and more of that dungeon, as well as probably, I would imagine, more things about the earth or about the world as well. One thing i got to mention is the art. It's all incredible old-school art. Some of it, every so often, you get this... This new school, um, much more modern vibe fantasy piece, but they're usually small and they're usually creatures, and it just it totally it, it works. It absolutely works. The the vibe. This book is heavily influenced. I mean, look at this piece of art. Excellent piece of art. This book is heavily influenced by 80s fantasy. I mean, on almost every page, you have. I mean, every sorry, I shouldn't say every page. At the introduction of every chapter, you have quotes from different things. This one is a quote quote from Krull, the movie. There are, there's a quote from Masters of the Universe, the movie, <laughs> with Dolph Lundgren, which, as soon as I saw it, I was like, I've made the right choice. This is a good book to own. Um, quotes from Conan the Barbarian, Red Sonja, um, and there's a ton of influence from Alien and Aliens, I should say. Um, 70s and 80s horror, sci-fi, fantasy. Because this is definitely um, old school in its in that it's bordering on the the science fiction in the way that Krull does or the way that Masters of the Universe does. Clearly fantasy, but there's elements of of space travel and aliens in here too. Like the gods, some of the gods are clearly space travelers, or at least one of the most important like past NPCs came from the, the stars. Um, and it just very clearly is a you know an alien. Um, but the the art in this book is incredible. The design of it. Now, it's just a, it's a lot of information. You're going to do a lot of reading if you're going to run this book. I mean, it's 470 pages, so obviously you're going to do a lot of reading. This is not old. This is not OSR in its, uh, you know, at least it's not one side of the OSR, which is like the quick, punchy, easy to read, easy to use book. This is not necessarily that. This is a wealth of information, a wealth of dungeons and encounters and and locations. Um, there are new monsters in here, uh, and they're detailed later. 
but there are reskinned monsters, and of course then there are monsters. This book requires old school essentials, or it says it does, but I'm not going to run it for old school essentials. I'm definitely running a campaign in here for probably Shadow Dark. Um, you could run it for 5e if you wanted. There would be a lot of changes to make, but you could run it for almost anything because it's just got so much. You could have it be a campaign, or you could have it be a set for one-shots. You could put your whole world there, uh, whatever you would like. So Volume 1 and the overview of what's going to be in Volume 1. Um, um, running Gods of the Forbidden North. What kind of what's the style of play for this particular um, dungeon or this particular book? I should say. Excuse me. Um, it's an open world sandbox. There's also you could play it as an adventure path, so that there are connections to the various dungeons, and you could play it much more as like go here, go here, go here. And then there are ways he says of sort of if you want to do it as a hex crawl, if you want to do it as a wilderness exploration in a sandbox, there are that's kind of how the game assumes it, but he gives you advice on how to transfer it into more of like a montage travel where you go from location to location to follow the quote unquote story. Um, there are principles of encounter design that he gives you to show you kind of how to balance things if you want to make your own designers uh, encounters and, and how he approached the question of balance. Um, there are cool adventure reward totals so you know ahead of time what you're getting your players into in terms of treasure to be found, monster XP to be found. Really cool so that you know exactly where you're going. And this is such a great piece of art. It's old school, but it's also gruesome. And that's one of the things we're going to see about this book is that it's definitely dark in its tone. Um, in that sense, it's just right up there with 80s fantasy where it's sword and sorcery, it's whimsical, it's got, uh, you know, a tongue-in-cheek vibe at times, but very often it cuts right back to gritty death and destruction. And there are some more adult events and, and quests, um, things that involve things you probably wouldn't want to play with younger players. Um, there's a, a quest line, for example, that's not necessarily required in the main introductory adventure. It's sort of like a follow-up to the main introductory adventure, but this woman is kidnapped and sold to a brothel, and it's probably not something you'd want to play with young players, right? Or at least you'd want to have a conversation. <laughs> um, but it's straight up, I mean, it's straight out of Big Trouble Little China. In fact, the villain kind of behind all of that section of the event is just... The, the main villain from Big Trouble Little China. So I like it, but it's definitely not, you know, going to be for everyone's table. But this book, if you don't like the old school 80s fantasy vibe, you're not going to like this book. That's basically it. I love it. I think it's one of my favorite vibes in the world when it comes to RPGs and fantasy generally. But if you don't like Conan, you don't like Red Sonja, you don't like the events that take place in them, you don't like Kroll, you don't like Masters of the Universe, um, you're not going to like this book. Here it is, a quote from Skeletor, Masters of the Universe. Oh, really good. So you get an events timeline of the sort of history of this region. Um, what's been going on here? There's this huge world eater monster. <laughs> really great piece of art there. Then there's this uh, uh, alien who came to help. And obviously, I mean, this looks like straight up out of Masters of the Universe, in the movie at least, in terms of the design of like the ships and things. But it's also come out, it comes out of Crawl, too. Those are two big influences, I think, in, in terms of the art direction. Um, but, uh, but there's a lot of other stuff too. So here's one of the examples of what I meant. This piece of art is, I don't know if you can see it super well, but it's a bit more new school. It doesn't have that old line and ink art. It's not the same kind of bulky, blocky images. This is definitely digital art and it's definitely um, more modern in its sensibilities, but it works. It fits with the tone and it definitely has something about it that's very appealing to me, even though it's horrific and, and gruesome. Um, I mean, this has been about 10 minutes. I'm in 36 pages in. And we're, we're <laughs> you know, this is this is a book that is, uh, it's going to take you a while to, to process and to go through. It's just, again, an embarrassment of riches in this one. The Skull God is kind of the big bad that you're, you're dealing with now. And there's a lot of references to him and his defeat and how he wasn't banished. And he's actually still coming back and hiding beneath the earth. And that's kind of the main, the main thing going on. Um, in the background and leading up to the, the actual game itself. Um, there's a, the city that you begin in was settled by sort of a Roman Empire equivalent, and there's definitely Roman influence in the way that it behaves, in the names, and in some of the, the uh, NPC portraits. But the Roman Empire, that empire that it refers to, is fallen, and so it's kind of like, uh, you know, perhaps something like Britannia after the fall of Rome. There's much more you know, barbarism, and it's much more precarious, and it's kind of on its own. They're not going to get reinforcements from the south, at least as far as I can tell. And it goes through the cultures, the different cultures of the north, the barbarian tribes, the religions of the barbarian tribes, the people who have settled here and what they were like, the different foreign nations that have uh, influences here. 
um, and the different foreign peoples that have influences here. I mean, this is a full on world setting with tons and tons of information about the different races and tribes and cultures and religions. Again, you could cut out any of the stuff you don't like. You could keep all the stuff you do like, but if you run the setting as written, you're gonna have to read a lot, a lot, a lot. Which I like because I think it's actually a cool setting and I like a lot of the writing. I like what he's done with it. But not everyone's gonna like that and people are gonna to wanna to make their own. But you totally could because you could just substitute your own cultures, you could substitute your own city, you could substitute whatever you wanted in this adventure. Great piece of art for a two-headed dragon. Um, chapter three, which is the city under the Aurora, the city of Vulcangard. And that's the main hub of this world. It's the main civilized place. There are other cities that you can go to, other towns and villages, but this is the one that has the most detail and is the biggest by far. You have law and order, cool map of the city with the various districts, and then each of those districts is detailed and what it's like there. The kinds of um, maybe maybe a major things happening there, major locations and NPCs that might be found there. Great NPC art, great character art, a, a nice full page spread, a uh, full page uh, piece of art for what that period, particular section looks like. I think this one's by Jacob Fleming, um, who's a person I follow quite a bit, an artist I like a lot. Um, this is the guy. This is basically the uh, <laughs> the villain from Big Trouble Little China. I don't know if you can see him, but it's it's just pretty much straight up out of that. Um, he is the not the big bad, but he is one of the. Um, oops, um, he's one of the uh, city villains. He's kind of a crime lord who's running things, and uh, he he's a slaver and he has this supernatural thing going on. And, um, cool goddess there and again just just all the different districts and regions and the rumors a d100 table of rumors in this city a great two-page piece of art of the people from the city fighting giants the giant kin and i like the way these giants are done these are not dnd 5e giants these guys are vicious they'll eat you uh, this is the oh, oh, chapter four is the uh, adventure that this book comes with a great piece of art there but uh, it's the Eye of Jakara, which is sort of the initial introductory adventure. So it's how you start off a voyage to the, uh, the location. The, you, you, you land there, you have adventures. It's, it's a quest path. It's pretty linear. There are some choices to make, and it ends on a more open note. And there are he gives you advice for how to make things go one way or the other and how to respond to the players doing certain things. But it's definitely like, a, okay, we're going to play... We're going to play a campaign and we're going to start you off with this introduction to the city and it'll introduce you to the regions, the tone, a lot of the important NPCs. It'll get you a sense of what's going on in the world, some of the factions at play. And then, once you finish this introductory adventure, which shouldn't take too long to do, a session, two sessions, maybe three sessions if you're slow about it, you're then kind of set loose. Um, there's a cool back alley ambush and a great little map of that alley where it happens. Um, so it's, it's not too long. And if you don't like linear adventures, you could skip it entirely. But if you want a good, I think, introduction to the setting, to the city, and to the potential uh, kind of like main story, although there isn't, there isn't really a main story. You could play this totally as a sandbox, but if you want to make it more of a main story, you could follow this up and have quest hooks leading them to particular places and keep it going that way. The conclusion and, and things that might be kind of left up in the air after the conclusion, um, and what the PCs might have as motivations, like, you know, if over the course of this adventure, these things will probably be left unfinished. Here's how you might want to finish them if the players seem interested. One of them being, of course, this kidnapping I referenced earlier. Um, the art of the uh, snow poppy den, in particular. And then uh, all of the adventure rewards and what you'll be at the end of this introductory adventure if you want to. Uh, and then you have the land of the long twilight, which is the world itself. And this is just a, you know, light and weather, air conditions, geography, travel, uh, a brief overview of the region, you know, bird's eye view, um, random tables for the different regions, different encounters you might have, and, you know, old school hex type travel time visibility, uh, you know, losing direction and what happens there, foraging chances, um, hunting chances. So this is really considered to be, you know, much more old school, Great piece of art of adventurers crossing a chasm on a rickety old bridge. Um, this is all assuming you're going to be doing hex crawl, wilderness exploration, and survival. But he has rules for if you want to do it much more, again, as like almost a point crawl or as a um, 
a region crawl where you kind of have your destination and you do a montage with maybe an encounter or two on the way um, and uh, set it. And he has, you know, he says you don't have to do it either way. Obviously, this is a, an open sandbox for the DM as well as the players. And the DM can use the information that he wants in the places that he wants. Um, the Ostian Road. Cool old Roman name there. And a great piece of art. Oh, my goodness. I love that piece of art so much. I love this guy in particular. That very evil knight, Roman knight look. Um, and the different locations. Now, here is one of my complaints about this book, for which, for the most part, I have almost no complaints about. But one of my complaints is that the maps inside the book, in the black and white, because that's the book is printed in black and white, it is just you have almost no way of reading what's inside these hexes. Now, it's ocean hexes, but they are still numbered. And, and there, they fit that. And you wouldn't have to use them. It's a, it's a minor complaint. It's a nitpick, nitpick exactly. But it just looks like a big hunk of black on the map. And, and you can zoom in and see that there's some things written on them, but it's really hard to see. And it's not just entirely useless because of the DM's map. There are actually some of those that are, have locations on them. As you can see, there are actual things on some of those hexes. This is, the, I guess, the hex map the players might have with blank, more or less. You know, the, the, the territory, but none of the stuff on it. And this is all of the locations. You can see it's filled out. These maps were made on World Arbor, by the way. Um, then in the PDF, you get these in color. And um, and I think if you buy the book, you'll have them in PDF anyway. But just keep that in mind. It's just something that, it's a little nitpick. If there were another way of <laughs> doing these pages, I don't know if you can make two pages in a book color and the rest black and white but it might have been worth it just to have something here distinguished. So, I don't know. I think this piece of, uh, this piece of art makes up for it. <laughs> but it's still a complaint. You have cool wolf here, and uh, you've got your, uh, a lot of text, a lot of text in these places. Again, breaking down details of some of these locations, which are less dungeony, less crucial to the overall plot or story, but they have, you know, lo their locations or adventures can happen, and there are monsters there and people there, and struggles to have and adventures to have. It's just a great um, description of the world. The world is interesting and the different locations are all I wouldn't say they're all amazing but they're all at least they're all at least good and then many of them most of them are really good or excellent. Um, some of them are pretty minor, right? Just a little place but, but uh, some of them are awesome. And the art in this book is incredible. So this is another one of those pieces that I think is incredible. Definitely digital art. But you get this um, scale, right? So this is the big, obviously influenced by Alien. And that's how big a human is. Tiny next to it, you can barely see it. This thing is huge in the lake. You don't want to mess with that guy. Um, so again, a lot of pages of hex descriptions and the things there, Cyclopses. Cool whirlpool at sea, monsters, specters. This really cool, like, you step into it and it's actually a jungle. It's an ice cave, but you go inside and it's a jungle, so it's a nice change of pace from the snow and frost. There's a murderer's cottage. Your spirit wants to possess you. And um, just lots and lots of great art. Lots and lots of great locations. Page after page after page of locations. Uh, I'm just skipping ahead here. Here's Skullberg, which is another settlement that you can run into. This is one of my favorites, uh, Boot Rock. It's a location out in the wilderness that's on the path towards kind of the, the deep wilderness. And the tradition is uh, adventurers who make it back safely leave a pair of boots on the rock in as a sign of their return and their success. And also because some of the adventurers who make it back there have barely made it back and you know their boots are worn through and they're frostbitten and dying and so you leave the boots there as an offering for the next person that comes by who's not so lucky. Which I think is cool. There's stuff like that throughout the book too. Cool little bits of world building and things that the players will... Again, um, I like this idea of flashes of, of, of telling the players that um, the world's real. Flashes that give the players a sense that, oh, this is a lived-in place with tradition and folklore and history and stuff. I love that, because you can't you can't keep up that fiction, that the world is a real place and that it actually is, you know, uh, the, the, where the players live 100% of the time. So it's best to, you know, make sure that nothing breaks the illusion, and then you have these moments where the players feel oh, a connection to the, the history of the world or the traditions of the place. 
I like that a lot. Another great piece of art. Giants here. And then uh, the conclusion and the adventure rewards for the entire thing that has just come before. Where the treasure is, where the monsters are, and how much XP they'll give in old school turns. Great. So if you want to know, just at a glance, how high level the characters will be after they do X, Y, or Z, you know. It's really cool. And the magic items they can find as well. Lots of magic items. Another great piece of art on the front cover. And another one. This arm coming through the wall. The door. Warning him off. Um, so this is another big... This is where... Chapter 6 is where the, the actual um, dungeons are detailed. Um, more cars. More calls. More calls. Uh, two. More calls, too. And... Um, you have a map of the tomb with what's going on there and the uh, adventures you can have there. Um, and there are lots of dungeons in the following chapters. Um, and what's going on there, the conclusion of each, and uh, how to connect to other things. As well as, again, magic items you can find there, monster XP and treasure XP. A breakdown for every dungeon. The Bog Ruins of Fort uh, Ikenvar. Kenvar. Um, this is a really cool place. It's a slaver hub, but they are facing some very serious problems. Now, this is one piece of art that I, I wonder about. I'm, I'm sure it's not a, a mistake, but just this seems like, well, maybe it is a mistake. I don't know. But like, there's a lot of extra white space at the bottom of the page, and it looks like it's getting cut off at the top. So I, I, I think maybe that's an example of a, of a badly formatted piece of art, but I don't, I don't know. Um, it might just be by design. It just kind of catches the eye. So if it was by design, it might not be a great choice. But it's not obviously egregious. It's, it's You can tell it's such a minor nit nitpick of mine because the rest of this book is just incredible. I have to find little tiny things to, <laughs> to, to complain about. Um, another cool dungeon here. It's a slaver camp. Um, with, and they have active um, uh, relations back to um, the big city. Uh, there's some cool faction play going on here, but they are trying to survive a very horrifying creature, this guy, and uh, the Lurker in the Darkness. It's a creepy worm thing uh, that devours people who go near it, the Guzzler. Really creepy, but cool and effective, and a lot of the stuff in this book is like that. Creepy stuff that's really cool and really effective. The great piece of art, horrifying uh, off uh, altar a tool which the Gessler uh, worships or maybe just lives near. And again, breakdown of all that stuff. Um, and then there's the Barrow of the Eight or late Barrow of the Eight. And again, there's a um, epigram. Is that what they call that? Epigraph. Beginning of each of these. This is from the Black Company. Uh, by Glenn Cook. And Barrow of the Eight. All the maps are original for this dungeon, I believe. There's a Dyson Logos map that's very similar to that one, which is what makes me wonder about the influence, but it's not Dyson Logos. Um, and then we have the Lost Temple of... I'm not even going to bother trying to say that name. The of Surface Ruins with a pit down and uh, frozen people, the under temple, with uh, more stuff going down there, with uh, good cool hieroglyphs about what's going on here, horrible mutations that are happening, these skeletons are burning out acid, or b belching out acid, um, rune marked skeletons, a cool uh, Tomb of Horrors reference, that's also one of the things that's quoted in this book is the Tomb of Horrors, this creepy hallway of faces. And uh, the stairs leading down. Uh, Watcher on the water, which is of course a reference to Lord of the Rings. There's a cool cracking uh, bridge which leads to this huge tower. And another one of these nasties that lives nearby. Um, some of the NPCs that are around there. The cult which is operating out of this tower. And uh, details of the uh, first floor of the tower. Crab creatures. Another piece of uh, Jacob Fleming art, which I love. 
higher levels of the tower, the second floor. What's going on here? Again, it wouldn't be an 80s fantasy if there weren't a helpless maiden being sacrificed by an evil cult. And you can rescue her. Um, maybe get there in time. And uh, really interesting stuff happening in this dungeon. Third floor. And this is all going up, obviously. But there is a big dungeon um, in the region that goes down into the earth. And only the first few, there's the light of the tower once you activate it and fin finish the end of it. And there's this kind of quest that's being asked. It's a great piece of art. I thought it was AI generated because a lot of AI generated art looks like this, but I don't think it is. I think it's actually drawn and done. Um, and that's it for the major dungeons. So there is going to be part two and part three are going to detail more and more stuff that goes, again, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what they're going to detail, but I do know that the mega dungeon is going to be detailed in the next two books. For now, we don't have it. We just have the surface and plenty of adventures to keep you going until the next book comes out, which I don't know the uh, the time frame of that. You have monsters and NPC stat blocks, and a lot of them. Quite a few. All of them. Now, there's no art for most of these monsters. Some of the art is earlier on for the NPCs and the, and the uh, stat and the particular monsters. You see it elsewhere, but um, it isn't laid out. So that's all of them. That's a lot of monsters. How many was that? I mean, that's what? Um, from page 37. It's like it's like 40, almost 50 pages of monsters. Special magic items and spells you can find here uh, in the region. And again, a lot of them. A lot of them, which I think is really cool. And then uh, referee rules for particular things. Um, possession is a big thing that can happen to you. It's a big uh, danger. So you have rules that relate to it and how it affects you. Um, all of that. And then quests and discovery um, awards. And these are like random quests, or rather quests from particular locations, but you could also have quests that lead you there or other things that might lead you there. Kind of a cool idea if you, if you can't think of a reason to get your players to a particular place, or maybe if they do particular things, they get bonus XP. You can do that. And then a glossary of names, because this book is huge with a lot of characters and a lot of NPCs, and so there's a glossary of names. And then there's an index with everything in it. Um, and then a couple final pages of supporters who back this. And then the authors and the artists, and there's a brief uh, annotated bibli bibliography for all the artists, or an annotated artist list of the authors and what they're like and where you can find them more. So this book is absolutely massive. As you can see, it is incredible. I highly, highly recommend this book. If you want it in physical copy, um, go for it. It's an awesome, solid book. The construction isn't, you know, the, the best I've ever seen. It's it's a, you know, print-on-demand drive through RPG book. And it's huge, so it's got that thick, um, you know, spine thing going on. The spine is fine. I mean, it's not damaged or anything like that. That's not what I mean, but you can see. It's, uh, it's not, doesn't have, um, Again, the, the, the design of the book itself is, it's, it's totally satisfactory. It's not, it's not one of the, the draws of the book. The draw of this book is the sheer amount of stuff and how cool it is. I think it's really well written. The tone is excellent, right up my alley, 80s fantasy. Um, and I think that Robert has done an excellent job of executing his vision. This is absolutely a labor of love. I can't even imagine how long this book took to write and put together. Um, and the fact that it's volume one of three, I'm not sure how far along in the process those books are, but if they're anything like this, they're going to be uh, instantly on my, I mean, they're going to be on my shelf regardless. <laughs> but if they're like this book, they're going to be prized possessions. So um, definitely check it out in PDF at least. I would recommend if you like having physical books, um, grab it, but it's not one of those things that you know you need the physical book. It's it's pretty big and it's hard to navigate through because there's no ribbons or bookmarks and uh, it's it's well laid out, but there's no special um, you know attention paid to making you know tabs on the sides that are certain colors or referenced. You know there's, there's no like additional help given to navigate through the book. And so the PDF is probably the better way to go for most people if you're going to be using this, um, especially if you're playing online, which most people play online now these days. Highly recommend. 
check it out. Uh, Gods of the Forbidden North by Robert Alderman. Uh, thumbs up. Two thumbs up. All right. Well, I hope this has been interesting to you guys, and I'll see you around.